Thank you. So again, uh, I'm going to try to clarify a certain number of issues over all of which are controversial. Uh, once, of course, what did Einstein, Polsky, Rosen really say? What did Bell really prove? Is there non-locality in the world? Is that just a defect of Bohm's theory? How does non-locality work in Bohm theory? Is there a conflict with relativity? So uh, stay tuned for all these uh, answers to all these questions. I think that works out. So this is my program. Einstein boxes, non-locality, proof of non-locality, how it works in the point Bohm, relativity, and historic, if I have time, explain why people, very famous people, completely misunderstood them. So let's start with Einstein boxes, which is an, uh, an example which was also done due to the brain. You have a box with a single particle in it. You cut the box in, box in two halves without touching the particle, let's say. And then you have B1 and B2, and you send one box on one side, another box on the other side. And uh, the state then becomes a, a sum of B1 plus B2 where bi means the particle is in box bi, and why do I put quotation mark? Because in order to quantum mechanics, it's ambiguous. You may think the particle is in the box without a quotation mark, or is going to be found in the box if you make a measurement. These are not the same thing. So to clarify, the idea here is that the wave function is uniform? Yes, then it's, yes, you can take a, yes, what you do, this is a uniform wave function that's over the box, and this is a uniform wave function over each box. Or maybe it vanishes on the on the edges, something like that. Never mind. Ah, I already forgot something. I wanted to start something unrelated to this lecture to make a remark about something I've heard in this school several times. That science is about what used to be called saving the phenomena. That's the end of 19th century, beginning of 20th century expression. What we need to do is to account for our experiences, to uh, explain, uh, you know, not explain maybe, but uh, uh, describe the world as we see it, as we perceive it, okay? All these sentences I've heard and many, many times in this version of quantum mechanics. So you should look for the laws of nature, how things work, how things really are. All this is bad metaphysics, okay? You have to just say the, 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 the uh, it was even said in Greek, I mean, said the phenomenon. And then there is a, there is a philosopher of science, or phil philosopher of the mind, rather, who is, you might like very much, in general, uh, we'll just hide his name because he's not very, he may not be known to many of you, Jerry Fodor, who is dead now. And he made a very good point. He said, look, if all you want to do is account for your experiences, then do this. Shut your ears, close your eyes. Have a minimum amount of experience. That's very easy to do. How come Newton didn't think of that? You see, once you think about it, you realize this all blah blah about experience, your own experience, accounting for them, is just nonsense. I mean, what science tries to do with experiment is to find the most difficult test to choose between different theories about the world, not about their experiences. The point isn't to account for our experience, but to know how the world works. And that was common to Newton, Boltzmann, Gibbs, Einstein, Maxwell, and all these people. It's only the quantum philosophy, which has said, oh, you can't understand the world, so you, can, uh, you don't have to worry about that, etc. But without, outside of quantum philosophy, we don't uh, do this thing about our experience. Anyway, that was something I should have said to start. So now we go back to this ambiguity that we don't know exactly what BI means. So the two half boxes are separated. One is sent to New York and the other to Tokyo. And you open one of the boxes and you don't find a particle. You know that it is in B2. And in quantum mechanics, it means that it's a measurement. Therefore, the state collapses to one of the terms, namely B2. And if you open the box B2, you will find a particle. But now you can ask, is the reduction of the state, a physical operation, or does it represent only our knowledge? And that's the distinction I've been making all the time between what I call epistemology and ontology, namely, is it only related to our knowledge? We didn't know in which box the particle would be, which would be true also for a classical particle. After all, we could have uh, unknown, we know in which box it is. 
or is actually physical. For example, in GRW, you explained that yesterday, in GRW with matter density, there will be half electron in each box, and when you open one box, one half of the electron jumps to the other one. That's what happens instantaneously. So GRW is not local even in that situation. But let's take this. If it's physical, then there is a non-local form of causality, or so-called an action at a distance, because it means to change the system over there by opening the box in one place. So you open the box in Tokyo and you change what happens to the box in, in uh, New York, like in uh, GRW. But, uh, forgetting about GRW, just going through all the quantum mechanics, you can ask that question. Is the physical reduction, which is non-local, a physical operation, or just uh, epistemic? If it's epistemic, it means what Einstein wanted to show, that quantum mechanics is incomplete, because there are other variables than the quantum state that describe the system. Namely, the, this variable will tell in which of the half box the particle is without quotation mark before one opens either of them. Yeah. Um, if I understand correctly here, you put it again, to, again, you put it implicitly a really realistic understanding in. Because, I mean, if, if it's epistemic, I don't see this, uh, this that it follows that there has to exist something else. I mean, as you said before, when you discussed the word is, you said is could mean you found it in the measurement, or if you have a realistic reading, then this really means in an ontological sense that there is something. So I'm asking, I'm making a dilemma. You see, if it's physical, if you change, if the state is something physical, not just, you see, the state could be like your classical probability. You could throw a coin, and then you don't know if it's head or tail. So that's epistemic, but the coin is actually uh, head of tail, and whether you look at it or not. And then, of course, you put this one. So you could think, many people think of the quantum state just like classical probability, but it evolves in a strange way. So it's epistemic, you don't know. That means that the particle is in one of the boxes. Yeah, but let me give a second reaction to that. Yeah. Jean is not making an assumption. He's asking a question about reality. His question is not about what will come out of the experiment. Everybody knows what comes out of the experiment. The question is, what is really there? Well, was there a fact about where the particle is before uh, the first person made the measurement or not? So I have a problem with asking the question, but at least um, allowing for the possibility that there is no answer for that is not uh, irrational or is, is allowed. So I think it, it from a philosophical sense to me. point of view, you, you, you have to leave at least the option open that there will be no answer to this question, or there can be no answer to this question, at least in principle. How could there be no answer to the question? If, if you're not if you're not a realist, you don't have the question. It's simple. Okay. If you ask the question, you are a realist. Okay, yeah, but, but, but so, 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 so you're allowed not to it's possible that the question isn't, isn't cannot be asked. Yeah, of course, of course you can. Yeah. So I can ask so, you but it was asked. asked. So how can it not be asked if it was asked? I'm only discussing with this error because there's if I understand the error as an that's what it means. That's what epistemic means. I don't know if it's an implication, but if it's an implication then if epistemic and I'm a realist, then I have the implication question. But epistemic for me means that there is a fact of the matter of where the particle is, but we don't know which one, which is the natural interpretation which you would do if the particle was replaced by a, you take one electron and then you take a bigger particle, bigger, bigger, and at the end you will say yes, it's in one of the boxes, we don't know which one. Yeah. It's so it's epistemic, it's that's what I call epistemic. It's a valid position, I'm just saying that in the, behind your implication, you, you have additional the assumption that you are real. And that's, that's okay, I just wanted to point that out. But then no, no, there is no assumption. You're, you're, you're confusing yourself there. Yeah. There's no okay. Okay. assumption. I don't understand what realist means, okay? But epistemic means for me, okay, it's one of the, it is in one of the boxes and we don't know which one, and the other is, it sort of jumps from one box to the other or you change something physical when you open one of the boxes. That's the dilemma posed by Einstein. And of course, he thought that his argument proved the incompleteness of quantum mechanics, and for him and probably everybody else at the time, action at the distance were continued. From the point of view of the Bohm, Bohm theory, quantum mechanics is incomplete. The complete state includes the position of the particle. And of course, those variables specify which half box the particle is before one opens either of them. There is no paradox with the boxes from the point of view of the double Bohm theory, and no non locality whatsoever, unlike in GRW. Okay? But now let's put aside the completeness and prove non-locality directly. You cannot prove it with the boxes because Bohm is local in that example and 
complete quantum mechanics, and uh, it's a book. Uh, okay. So now, what? Uh, let me define non-locality. I mean, a non-local causality, not just correlation. So in the boxes example, the effect is instantaneous if there is non-local. For example, in GRW, you would create, you would have half particle uh, disappearing in one box, and then a full particle created in the other box far away. It's instantaneous. The effect is arbitrarily far. You can send one and a half box on the moon or Mars. Or and the effect does not decrease with the distance because it's, you know, you create a destroyed particle. And it's individuated. That's very strange. But if you take many, many boxes with this particle in it, then of course you can have, uh, it will always be open in one box, will affect the other box from which which came from the splitting into of, a, of the original box. But if you have a million box, opening one box does not affect what happens in the other boxes. You see, uh, you have a million box that you put in, put in, cut in half. So each half would influence the other half, but not the half of the other boxes. And of course, the way it is, it can be used to transmit, transmit messages. Uh, I mean, that, that's, a, let's say that's a question. You can say that if something is not action which is not local, then it could possibly be used to transmit messages. Let's consider Newton's gravity. Newton's gravity is not local in this sense, because if I move my arm, then I change the distribution of mass in the universe, and that affects the gravitational force, therefore the acceleration, therefore the velocity, therefore the position of everything in the universe. But, and it's in, instantaneous in the theory. It goes arbitrarily far, but of course it decreases with distance very, very fast. Okay? And it's not individuated because I affect all the bodies in the universe in the same way. And it can be used to transmit messages because I could move my arm or not move it, and then I could send sequence of zeros and one if people can actually detect the effect of my arm, which of course is impossible in practice. So people didn't like that, physicists didn't like this thing in Newton cavity. And for example, field theories have two A, like uh, electromagnetism, but it's not instantaneous, it propagates at a finite speed, and they, they are four, of course, because you transmit messages with electromagnetic wave, but since nothing is instantaneous, and the effect does decrease with the distance, it's not really uh, that pretty, effect, pretty uh, ordinary. Now the question is whether quantum mechanics will provide you a phenomenon with one three, not four. Four would be a serious problem, as I explained, but it will be instantaneous, extend arbitrarily far, and individuated, just like in the boxes, but it won't be proven with the boxes. So let me prove it first with an anthropomorphic analogy, and then explain to you how it works in quantum mechanics. So you have added the proverb that Alice and Bob. Alice goes to a place called X, Bob goes to a place called Y, and when they are at X and Y, far apart, or maybe just the two different doors here, they are asked a question. But the question doesn't mean anything. It's just given a number, one, two, three, and they have to say yes or no. This is the game. And then they, but they, they meet in the room, like uh, we meet in the room, and then we go out, and then we meet again, etc. And the question and the answer are back. But there are two rules that the statistics of the answer start to follow. The first one is when the same question is asked at X and Y, Alice and Bob always give the same answer. Now again, there is a dilemma. Either the answers are predetermined, or there exists a form of causality at the distance after one asks the question. For example, Alice could have question one, and she calls Bob, and she says, look, at question one, I say yes. Now if Bob has question two or three, he says whatever he wants, and if he has question one, he says yes also. And then the answers are coming. That's one possibility. But now if the time between the time between uh, they are more or less instantaneous and there is no time for the telephone communication or any communication whatsoever at subliminal speed between Alice and Bob, that possibility is ruled out. So there would be some sort of telepathy as Einstein called it. Or, of course, that's the more natural thing, is they agree in advance to a strategy. Alice and Bob, we, we agree, you have Alice and Bob, and we agree if it's question one, we both say yes, 
If it's two, we would say no, and if it's three, we would say yes. Okay? Then, of course, if we are giving advance on the strategy, then, of course, the answer will be perfectly coordinated. Okay? This is the EBR argument. It was reformulated by Bohm in his book, so, but I will use EPRB sometime because it's Bohm's formulation. EPR was speaking of position and momentum anyway. That's, let's call, let me call that the EPR dilemma. One horn of the dilemma means non-locality. There is some communication between Alice and Bob, but at superluminal speeds. The other horn means that the answer are predictable. You see, the, the, the dilemma concerns what happens in every experiment. It doesn't concern the statistics of the result. I don't care about the statistics. I have this perfect correlation. I'm trying to explain them. I don't see any other possibility. If you find another possibility, say it now. I mean, I said two possibilities. One, they prepare the answer in advance, or they have some form of communication when they get the answer to the question. To explain the perfect correlation. And again, you do it a million times, OK? But the problem is that the second assumption alone, namely the fact that the answers are predetermined, leads to a contradiction with observations made where the questions are different. That was the genius of Bell. He said, what happens if you ask different questions to a listener? Two there and three there, one here, two there, etc. There are also a certain statistics. And that statistics is in contradiction with the mere assumption that the answers are predetermined. There was a dilemma, two home, predetermined non-locality, predetermined leads to contradiction, only remains a negation of locality, so that's a proof of non-locality. Okay? non-locality of answers are predetermined, and then Bell refutes that, so non-locality remains. That's the logic of the argument. Mm -hmm. if, you don't put together, if you don't put the two arguments together, then you are lost. But if you put the two arguments together, then you are perplexed. Mm -hmm. So if you let me try to repeat my answer. So you prepare the experiment by extracting both analysis that if they, if they have sent to investigate answer one to three, they answer in a certain way. Yes. And then you do statistics to put them up, and you see that there are both perfection one, the answer yes, or yeah, 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 yeah. And then, okay. Then I look at the statistics when the questions are different. So there are three questions and two possible answers. So if answers are given in advance, there are only eight possibilities, right? Yes, 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 no, blah, 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 okay? In each case, you notice there are these two questions with the same answer. That's true. So these are all the strategies, what you call These strategies. are all the strategies. So we could agree, you are this and I am Bob, and you know, you need to always say yes, or say yes, no, yes, etc., etc. There are only eight possible strategies, right? Because there are three questions and two answers. And of course, you see that here, you will have two no's, there you will have two no's, there you will have two yes, Always two answers are the same. Therefore, by some additivity, if you want to be fancy, but the frequency of the answer to one equals the answer to two, plus the frequency of the answer to two equals the answer to three, plus the frequency of answer to three equals answer to two must be bigger than or equal to one. Because in every run of the experiment, at least one of those three must be, must be true. And of course, it could be all three true. For example, here, the answers are all the same. And here, the answers are all the same. Okay? So the frequency must be at least one. But in some experiments, which I will describe later in this talk, these frequencies are all equal to one quarter. Therefore, you derive that three quarters are bigger than one, which I hope that you will agree is false. So you derive a contradiction. The reasoning that gives a proof that three quarters is bigger than one means the assumption is wrong. The only assumption was this predetermination, therefore, I'm looking at this proof. That's a proof. The simplest there is. I mean, some we are talking about conditional probabilities, and some this is much simpler. It's not due to me, but it's simpler. 
So how the experiment? This is how Herman described them. Very, it will not please any real experimentalist, but you have a, a box here, you push a button, and then you send some signals, we don't know what it is, and it's recorded here, and there are three, three uh, mm -hmm. positions of the needle there, one, two, three, these are the three questions, and then of course, because I don't have a color, you don't see, it's either a green light or a red light. No, okay. here, here it's important that the needle doesn't show the outcome, but it's something that the Alice yeah. or Bob can turn. Exactly, the, the experimentally, so some, some experimentalist pushes the button there and sends something, we don't know what, particles maybe, and here you have the other experimentalist you can choose, that's, at, that's X and Y, and at X and Y there is somebody who asks a question, which means he puts this needle one, two, three, and this is some sort of measurement on whatever comes from here, I'm totally agnostic at as to what happens with the moment, you don't need to speak of particles, you don't need a quantum mechanics. You are just saying that you could do this experiment just blindly, without knowing anything, and you just push the push, put these things on this position one, two, three, and you see a red or a green light flashing. Now you record red and green is yes and no, and so you record the, the result, and then you find the surprising statistics. And, and, and you can give it to uh, you know, primary school kids, they don't have to understand anything to what they do, they just observe this phenomenon and the person has to account for that. So here are data made by me so that they fit what I want to prove, but you see, that means the question, you ask the question one on the left and the answer was what, uh, yes, one on the right, the answer is yes, this is one, yes, two, no, etc. Okay? I've the, given 54 data and a third of them have the same question on both sides. And they are in, in, in black face, in gold face, sorry. And uh, you see that they are, of course, perfectly correlated. Two, two, three, three. I mean, you get different answers. You could have one, one, yes, yes. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, never mind. Here you have two, yes, two. I mean, you don't have the same answer, but they're always perfectly correlated when the questions are the same. When the questions are different, most of the time, they are not correlated. But here, they are correlated, and they are correlated nine times, and nine times is a quarter of 54 minus 18. So that gives you the number of times when you get the same answer on both sides when you ask different questions. But most of the time, when you ask different questions, you get different answers. Okay? Now, so that's, that of course I have to explain these experiments which I will do now, okay? Because that's just, I'm just telling you the story with Bob and Alice. Bob and Alice don't know what they are doing. They, they just uh, ask this question, they do these statistics, and then oh, we do this experiment. And I want to explain how we do this. So X and Y, I think they are still under like apparatus that measure the spin along some direction. That was explained yesterday by Matthias. And one, two, three are three possible directions of that measurement, and the answer yes, no, are just up down. First, you consider a state of two particles, A and B, which is of that form. It's A up in direction one times B one, uh, down direction one, minus A down direction one, and up direction one for B. And this is called an entangled state. And entangled because it's not a product. You see, this state is a product of a state of A and state of B. Likewise, this is a product of state of A and state of B. But you, when you make a combination of that, it's not a product state. You can't write it as a product of a state of A and a state of B. Just try and it's not going to work. In, in one of my talks, I called this state the singlet state. Yeah, yeah, I'll come to that later. Okay. For the moment, I take only one direction. What? What? Yeah, it's just, a, I'm mentioning, it, it's just a, another name for this quantum state. It's a singlet state, but it's mostly, the more important thing is that it's entangled, that it's not a product. So, what's the meaning of that state? Again, I'm totally, I'm much more, uh, much further from experiment than Matthias was yesterday, but you send the particles to, to us, these are uh, uh, boxes which are in perpendicular to the motion of the particles, okay? There you have a magnetic field, it's really the gradient of the magnetic field which is indicated, but let's forget about that. 
then the meaning of the state, if you send those particles that are uh, at x and y, <coughs> and each box there is a field oriented in that direction, not in one, one possibility, the state has probabilistic interpretation, one possibility is that the particle A goes upward, meaning the direction of the field, and then the B particle necessarily goes downward in the direction opposite to the field. Okay? And the other possibility is that A goes downward and then B goes upward. Okay? You never see both particles going in the direction of the field or in the direction opposite to the one of the field. So if you wish this experiment, you have perfect correlation. Of course, I say the answer are yes on both sides. And here we have the direction up, direction opposite. But that's a convention. Decide that up is CS here and down is CS there and then we get perfect correlation. That's just a translation. The point is that they are perfect correlation. Okay? Now assume that there is no action of a distance of any sort. Namely the influence of the measurement on one side on the result on the other side. So measuring on one side can't affect the result on the other side. Then, of course, for this perfect correlation, we have to assume that the result on both sides are predetermined by instructions that the particle carries whether to go up or down in different direction that the particle has with it. That's again the dilemma. If measuring here has no effect whatsoever on there, how do you account for the fact that once it goes down, it always goes up and vice versa? Because they were prepared to do that. Okay? So you have to introduce, let's say, whatever you call random variable, A of 1 equals plus or minus 1, B of 1, where A of 1 means the A particle will go in the direction of the field, and A minus 1 means the direction will go in the direction opposite to the one of the field, and similarly for B. These are random variable in the sense that those values may vary from one run of the experiment to the next, because you prepare the same state and you repeat the experiment, and one time the particle A goes up, and then B goes down, or sometimes A goes down and B goes up. But, so, they are random. In that sense. They are hidden variables, the words which are not supposed to say uh, in good company, because they are not determined or included by the quantum state. The quantum state just tells you half of the time you want, they are, that for a given particle, it doesn't tell you that it has these answers. The reason it has these answers is because you assume locality, and then you have this hidden variable, that's exactly the reason of it you have. And if you wish, it's the same thing as the index of the half box in Einstein boxes experiment, namely in which box the particle actually is. Okay? Now consider three possible orientations for the magnetic field, in the H1, H2, H3, in again the plate perpendicular to the motion of the particle. You repeat many times the experiment, a million times, and you choose at random the orientation of the field on both sides. Okay? So sometimes it'll be the same, sometimes not. Okay, if you do it a million times, you'll have every possibility. When the orientation are the same on both sides, the particle will always go in opposite directions. Just like I said when there is only one direction. Because, and that's maybe where the singlet state enters, it's a mathematical fact that the state of the two particles is rotationally invariant in spin space, if you want to be fancy. It means that if you write it along the direction 1, it has this form, but then you can write it in direction 2, it has the same form, and 3 is at the same form, and in fact any orientation, it will have, the, uh, if you choose another orientation, it will be the same form. So it's perfectly, again, the perfect correlation of the 2 direction and the 3 direction. Okay? So the reason... No, it has to do with the correlation between the, the correlation between the, the, the it's not that it's plus or minus one half, it's that it's plus one half on that side and minus one half on that side, and that's true for all directions for that particular state. The fact that it has the same form is rotation variance in spin space. Okay, it's, if you put a plus there, it wouldn't be true. Yeah, I mean, th this equation expresses that the state is rotationally invariant. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I said, so consequence. Anyway, it's a fact. Yeah. 
So the reasoning made up of as a consequence of simply assuming no action this implies that we are obliged to assume that the result on both sides are predetermined by instruction carried by the particles in all three directions. Right? So let us introduce more random variable, A of alpha equal plus or minus one, B of alpha equal plus or minus one, for alpha equal one, alpha equal two, alpha equal three. I did it for alpha equal one, now I'll do the same thing for the three directions. Where again, A of alpha plus one means the A particle will go in the direction of the field and the direction is alpha and minus one the direction opposite. When the, you choose the direction alpha, alpha being one, two, three. Okay? In order to account for the perfect anti-correlation, you must assume that A of alpha is minus B of alpha. Because they're always opposite. Now since alpha takes only two values and there are three choices of direction, Whatever the values of those variables, for each set of value, you always have either A of 1 equal A of 2, A of 1 equal A of 3, or A of 2 equal A of 3. One of the three must be true, and they could all three be true. Okay, so that more often these identities even then. So by assuming that those values exist, you must have that the frequencies of A of 1 equal A of 2, A of 1 equal A of 3, A of 2 equal A of 3, the sum of those frequencies must be bigger than equal to 1. But then, of course, since you have A of alpha equal minus B of alpha, there you substitute A of 2, A of 3 uh, by minus B of 2 minus B of 3. Okay? Now, if you change, that's a problem now. If you choose direction 1 at x and direction 2 at y, so here is x and here is y, and we take direction 2, the particle goes in the direction of the field, then B particle will go in the direction of the field, meaning B of 2 equal plus 1. 75% of the time, and the opposite direction, 25% of the time. That's a quantum fact for that choice of n, which I will come to later. So, you have the same result with five other choices of different orientations. You could do uh, three there and uh, two there and so on. Every choice, you always get only a quarter of anti-correlation. That means that A of 1 equal minus B of 2 only a quarter of the time. So that the frequency of A of 1 equal minus B of 2 is the same as by rotation and they are all the same, they are only equal to one quarter, then the sum of the frequencies is three quarter, and I just explained that we did one one, three quarter is less than one, so now we have the quantum contradiction. Okay? Which and this followed only by assuming that those values exist. Namely that the instruction, the result are predetermined. But that assumption followed from the one of locality. Namely, no influence of the measurement on one side on the result of the other side. Therefore, that latter assumption is false. The world is one. You can act at the distance instantaneously. Now, the number one quarter, maybe you can do that in the exercise tomorrow, anyway, it's in my slides. In the appendix, I explain how to compute this one quarter from quantum mechanical computation. Okay, for precisely the choice of angle. So in the, now, now let me explain what ordinary, ordinary quantum formalism says about it. Ordinary quantum mechanics. Well, the state of both particles is like this, as I said. Now what do they say? That's orthodox. That's textbook quantum mechanics. If you measure the spin direction 1, and if for R, A particle, not, not B, you do nothing to B, the state collapses. If you see 1, if you see up for A, then it collapses to that. If you see down, it collapses to that. The same holds if you measure the spin in direction two or three, collapse of the quantum state. But then the state has changed also non-locally for the B particle. Because in this state, for example, the B particle could be the up or down. But once you've done the measurement on A, it has to, if it's up for A, it has to be down for B. So this collapse of the state. So you have changed the state non-locally. But what does the state mean? We don't know what it means. All the quantum mechanics is ambiguous about that. The same dilemma, as if, now I can do the same dilemma in quantum mechanics as I did with dimensional boxes. Is the reduction of the state physical or epistemic? If it's physical, I change the state there by doing something only over here, so it's not local. If it's epistemic, then the only meaning it has for me is that the answers are given in advance. 
hands, I the particle B is one up or one down, two up or two down, three up, before the measurement of A, since by assumption the measurement of A cannot possibly change the physical situation of B. Okay? And then when you have all this discussion about quantum mechanics and about information, and they make a big mess in, when they speak of information, but what they mean by that is this, which then runs into a contradiction. The only way to maintain that this collapse is not physical is to assume what we just said, that these are these variables, A and A, B, alpha, etc. Okay? Then it makes sense to say that the quantum states are not information and that the collapse of the wave function occurs because we learn something about the system. By doing a measurement at A, like we learn that the particle, for example, is not in one half box, then we learn that it's in the other half box. We learn that the spin is up in direction uh, one for A, therefore we learn it's down uh, in direction one for B. But then show that this mean supposition that those variables exist lead to a contradiction. And he was very explicit about what it all means. So he said, let me summarize the logic that leads to the impasse. EPRB, where B refers to Bohm or reformulated, as I said, EPR spoke of position momentum, we can discuss that, but, you know, correlation are such that the result of the experiment on one side immediately foretells that on the laptop whenever the analyzer happened to be parallel. Analyzer being the stern gerlach the orientation of the stern gerlach magnet or the question situation, okay? If we do not accept the intervention on one side as a causal influence on the other, we seem obliged, you see Ben is very modest, he's very clear that he's, we're not, we don't seem obliged, we are obliged, to admit that the result on both sides are determined in advance anyway, independently of the intervention on the other side, by signals from the source, these are the, these answers. And by the local magnet setting. So of course the choice of the angle to of course there will be different answers for different choices. But this has implication for non-parallel setting, when you ask different questions, which conflict with those of quantum mechanics. The one quarter being of course a prediction of quantum mechanics which has been amply checked. So we cannot, very important, we cannot dismiss intervention on one side as a causal influence on the other. So we cannot dismiss that. So, how does it work out in the very world? Well, we saw yesterday, and I hope you're all convinced, that uh, the quantum state is not the total description of a system. You also have the position of the particle, and they exist independently of whether you look at them or measure them. Both objective will deterministically, with the deterministic equation, the quantum state and the motion of the particle, and then, of course, the result of any experiment will be determined by beforehand by the quantum state and the configuration of the measurement device. That's where the trick is. Now we'll repeat in my language what Matthias says, that the result of measurement of spin is not determined solely by the complete state of the particle, but also by the way the measurement device is set up. And there, there lies the secret of non-locality in the De Bruyne world. So let me repeat what Matthias said yesterday with my sim super simplified pictures. So here is a particle, that's a wave function, the particle which is located there, and it goes into a box with a magnetic field, a variable magnetic field, and one half, the wave function is a superposition, so I only indicate what happens in the z direction, the x direction, I sort of forget even though the particle moves in the x direction. Uh, it's a superposition of one up and one down, and then it so happens on the equation of motion that the wave function will split into two parts, one going one wave function going up with the <coughs> wind of one up and one going down direction opposite to the field. And in that particular picture, I put the particle here and it happens to go there. And there is a symmetry in the picture which will force the particle coming being here to always go up if it starts above the middle line. That's again this business that you can't cross uh, symmetry lines. So the, here I just described what I just said, that the one up will go in the direction of the field, the one down will go in the direction of the field. 
Il ne parle que des upper part of the support, or symmetric wave function, it will go upwards. That's because there is another line in the middle, just like there was in this picture yesterday. So for by a symmetric consideration, it has to go up. Okay? Now, come to catch. Repeat the same experiment with the direction of the field reverse, and assume that the particles start with exactly the same wave function and the same position as before. Okay? But the field now is there, so it means the up spin will go in that direction, and the down spin will go in the upper direction. Because the, the up, by definition, is the one that goes in the direction of the field, and the down goes in the direction opposite to the gradient to the field. But if the particle starts here, because of the nodal line, it will again go up. But now, of course, if it goes up in that situation, the spin of the particle will be down, where before it was up. You see? It goes in the direction opposite to the field. So if the particle was up, we have it spin down, although you measure exactly the same observer, but the spin the vertical direction, with exactly the same initial condition, for both the wave functions, the same, you start with the same wave function, the same particle position, in one situation, it goes up. It always goes up, let's say, spatially. But in one situation, it means it's in the direction of the field. The other situation is the opposite direction. So in one situation, we call it spin up. The other thing, we call it spin down. So, we, so it means that there is no spin. Spin value don't exist. There is no spin value. They do. If you know everything about God, then you know everything about the, the particle, the wave function, its position, etc. And it says now we are going to make a stern like experiment. You cannot tell what the result will be unless God tells you in which direction it means to fit in the stern The same, you get different results. And this is related and explained the non local character of the boy theory. So let me explain that. Now you take these correlated particles and you go on there, A goes to this plane, B goes to this plane, there is a magnetic field, and let's say it's all in the direction one. I'm not interested in different directions, I'm just interested in how do these perfect correlations work out and why there is no locality there. So the initial particle of the particle A, it will go up, and then of course B must go down with this orientation of the field. Because it means A goes in the direction of the field, and then B must go in the opposite direction. That's because one spin is up, the other is down. Okay? I mean, that's one possibility. Of course, A could go down. But again, I put the particle initially above the middle line. There's again a symmetry. So this guy has to go up. Okay? So the particle split in the wave function split in two in each box, and the particle uh, position are integrated by the arc dots. And then, you know, if the A particle starts initially above the horizontal line, it will always go in the upper direction, then in the direction of the field. But since the wave function are such that the anti-correlated B must go in the opposite direction. Now suppose you reverse the field there, but not in there. You don't change anything on, on the B side. You're changing on the A side. Then again, by the same reasoning of this middle line that the particles can't cross, this particle will have to go up, namely in the direction opposite to the field. But then the B particle must be anti-correlated with this one, so now it must go in the direction of the field, namely up, when the previous pictures were going down. Okay? But you have changed nothing on the side of the B particle. You have left the field intact. You just change the field there. And then the B trajectory will go up instead of down. So if you measure the A particle first, we'll see that it, the problem with this notion of first. In the point bone theory, the A particle starts above the horizontal line. It will always go in the upper direction, namely in the direction opposite to the one of the field. OK? So now it's, uh, it will go in the upper direction, but now, of course, B then must go in the direction of the field. If you compare these two figures. Okay, here you have the field in that direction, A goes up, B goes down. Now you change the field there, A still goes up, but now B go, must go, go up since it's anti-correlated with A. So B changes its direction depending on what you do on the A side, how it will far away. That's the way actually the distance occurs. Of course, if you only look at statistics, you don't see it. If 
you don't do the reasoning of them, you don't see, because the statistics would be the same, because the particles on the A side sometimes starts here, sometimes it starts there, and then of course they are, you know, on the other. So changing the orientation of the field on the left, while doing nothing whatsoever on the right, you affect the trajectory of the B particle, which may be arbitrarily far away from the A particle. This is one of the ways that action at the distance manifests itself in the point of view. This is genuine action at the distance, in fact, the A particle instantly affects the behavior of particles. The fact, but now, of course, you can say, oh my god, it's non local. Uh, but it's normal, it has to be non local, because I just proved that bench shows that reality is non local. And all the quantum mechanics is non local too, because the reduction of the wave packet is non local, the reduction of the quantum state is non local. The only way it escapes being non-local is by not answering the question. What does it mean? Ah, oh, it means we predict results of measurement. So when you discuss with physicists about this, when you say, how do you account for the perfect correlation? Well, it's predicted by the quantum state. Yeah, but then there is a collapse. It's non-local. Ah, but the collapse is epistemic. OK, so they are hidden variable. I don't know. They are not hidden variable. We don't want to hear about them in You can go around in circles. So ready to nail it down, do EPR first, and then we do well, et cetera. And of course, the, the prime bone theory is a quality rather than defect. We just show that any theory must be non local. And as I learned from that left, this is just what the doctor wanted. Because it's not more non local than it has to be. No, don't forget that in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, GRW, with matter, even in one particle in the box, for example, the matter jumps from Tokyo to New York. Uh, there's a half electron in both boxes, and then one half jumps instantly to the other side. No, no, that doesn't happen in both. So boom is not local for two particles, and the non-locality proof by Bell are always based at least on two particles, not one particle. So it's just what the doctor holds up. Now, we get into how to work the, uh, the trouble with relativity. Well, there is trouble with relativity, obviously, which comes from the relativity of simultaneity. So I won't go into a course of relativity, but you can have three frames of reference in this picture, which are indicated by green, blue, and red lines. Oh, it's not easy to see. Maybe you can show in the picture where the green the yeah, yeah. Red is. So the green is here, the red is here, and the, blues, the blue lines are there. OK? And they are lines of simultaneous events that are simultaneous with respect to each of the reference frames. You probably know from relativity that what is simultaneous with you depends on the reference frame. So for if there is a fast uh, rocket passing by me, what will be simultaneous for the person on the rocket is not the same as what is simultaneous for me. That's just basic fact about relativity. Mm -hmm. So the x-axis corresponds to the event simultaneously to A in the green frame, this axis in the red frame, and this axis in the blue frame. The event B is simultaneous with A in the green frame, okay? That occurs before A for the blue frame and after A in the red frame. So things can be simultaneous uh, at the distance, but some events occur before or after, depending on the frame of reference. Now you could think of construction like this, Xt here is A, B is simultaneous with A in the reference frame of A, and in B you consider a fast moving rocket for which the axis of simultaneity would be what I call Tb equals zero, then in this line. Not T equals zero, which is the axis for A, but Tb equals zero. So if A can, send a C, can act instantaneously on B, then B can act instantaneously on A prime, which is in the past of A in the reference frame of A. If you could send a message, then of course it would lead to very strange circularity. For example, you could send a message in the past of your grandmother telling her not to go out the day where she fell in the street and then had a bad accident or something like that. You could also tell yourself that the question at an exam is before you pass the exam and you can find all kinds of causal loops which are really uh, very strange. And physics is strange, but not that strange. It should not have that. So if you could message, you see, that would create those 
So, but you see, in the quantum formalism, if you measure the spin direction one at x before measuring it at b, and you see up, then the state collapses. If you see down, then just say it collapses. If you measure the spin at one uh, direction one at y before, oh, sorry, uh, before measuring it at x, you would change instantaneously, sorry, there is a mistake and then it should be x. So you want to change instantaneously the state at a, so because if you measure first the b particle, then you will act on the, you will collapse the state at a. So who measures first depends on the reference frame, as I explained. Uh, I mean, these things are separated, so who is doing the experiment first is relative to the frame of reference. The only solution would be to have an epistemic view of the quantum state, so there is no real action at the distance, just about information, and that leads to these pre-existing values, which implies that three quarters bigger than one, so that there are instantaneous action. Then relativity implies the existence of action on the past in certain references. So all our intuitive notion of causality collapses because this notion of based on the idea that causes perceived effects in an absolute sense and that does not depend on the reference frame. Obviously, if I hit Roderick uh, first and he hits me after that or the other way around, it matters a great deal for court cases and so on. So who does what first should be true in one reference frame? I can't go to the judge. I no, no, but in another reference frame, he hit me first. So unless one introduces a privileged frame of reference in which true causality holds. But the least one can say is that this introduction brings back the ether that's very nicely explained by Ben in, in this book which you haven't read yet but you should read. It contradicts the spirit of relativity. But there's nothing inconsistent. There's no contradiction with experiment. Now you, the usual question is, ah, but what about quantum field theory? What about relativistic quantum mechanics? Well, go to the textbook and try to find the analog of the world reduction of the collapse of the quantum state for this entangled state. It's never discussed in relativistic terms. Obviously, it can't be discussed because even in conventional quantum mechanics, who collapses the state of the other uh, is relative to the frame. So the question raised by Bill and Bell is not even raised. Luckily, you cannot use Bill and Bell to send messages. Otherwise, you can tell your grandmother not to go out, etc. Because each side sees a perfectly random sequence of yes and no, so if you repeat the experiment, in all directions you just see yes, no, yes, no, is red light, uh, green light, etc. And there is no way to control by acting on one side which answer will be received. So you cannot see, use this mechanism to send messages. But if you do this experiment in these three directions, etc., and each person after that tells the other by ordinary means by telephone which uh, measurement they have made without telling the result. Okay? Then the person, whenever the questions are the same, they know the answer on the other side. So they share a common sequence of yes and no without communicating this sequence. They just say, I measure in direction one, Bob says that, and Alice I measure in direction two, so we don't care. Sometimes they both measure in direction two, and then Alice knows exactly what Bob has seen, and so they can share the sequence of zeros and one. And that, of course, is the basis of quantum key. Cryptography. And the information does not come from the source, so there is a non local transmission of information, but which is not a message. The problem of causality remains. Sometimes people say, oh, you cannot send messages, so it's not a problem. Because messages are very anthropomorphic. You see, as uh, uh, Tim Morgan says, earthquakes and the Big Bang cannot be used to send messages, but they have effects nevertheless. Okay, just because you can't control it, to send messages, you have to be controlling the thing, the, the direction, the proof here. So if you choose a privileged reference frame with true causality holds, then the argument we can also show that this reference frame is an observable, which is unpleasant to say the least. So you have to choose your poison, because either you give up every notion of causality, or you introduce nothing reference frame or something like that. Now let me finish, because this is a recreation uh, by quoting misunderstanding of Bell by very, very famous people. So you have to be aware that you should not trust your professor, because, uh, because uh, even more clever people than them have said silly things about Bell. So Gellman said that some theoretical work of Bell revealed that the 
EPR rule, experimental center, could be used to distinguish quantum mechanics from hypothetical hidden variable theories. After the publication of Bell's work, various team carried out the EPR experiment. The result was eagerly awaited, although virtually all physicists were betting on the correction of quantum mechanics, which was in fact vindicated by the yeah, What are Maybe the word was not correction of quantum mechanics, but correctness of quantum mechanics. On the correctness, maybe. Okay, I have to check in the original, but maybe you're right, yes. Correctness, yeah. That's in the quark, in the quark in the Jaguar. Anyway, so what he's saying is this, that in the hypothetical random variable, are these variables A of 1, B of uh, A of 2, B of 2, etc., which I introduced. These are hidden variables because they are not in the quantum state. But I just say that you need to introduce them if you want to preserve locality and explain for the perfect correlation. So this is missing totally the EPR argument. Then, of course, it's true that Bell shows that you cannot introduce these variables. But that proves that locality is good. Because he misses the EPR part of the argument. Then there was an even more fantastic example where uh, Bell gave a talk about the socks of, it's called Bergman socks, uh, and the nature of reality. So that's in French, but because he was in France. And you know, there is a guy who is still alive, I think he, he was working at CERN, and he had the oddity to wear pink, uh, socks of different colors. So you could see that if a sock is pink, then the other is not pink. And if it's green, the other is not green. There are always of different colors. I mean, I don't think it was a very pedagogical example, but that was the example that they give to say, of course, there is no accounting, it says no accounting for taste, but there is nothing surprising here. Because the color of the socks pre-exists to us observing them. So you learn something here by looking at the socks there, you learn something on the other side. So that means you learn something by doing a measurement on one side on what is the case on the other side, okay? But Bell says in quantum mechanics it doesn't work because if you assume that you assume there are values pre-existing to the measurement and that's what he disproved. So here is how Bellman speaks of this. This very example, he did not understand the argument of Bell or maybe he didn't read it. He said the situation in light of Bergman socks described by John Bergman, and not he was a mathematician, but anyway, always wear one pink and one green sock. If you see one of his feet and spot a green sock, you know immediately that his other foot spots a pink sock. No signal is propagated from one foot to the other. Likewise, no signal passes from one photon to the other in the experiment that confirms quantum mechanics. No actual at a distance takes place. It's difficult to understand well more radically than that, because as I quote Bell before, he said we have to introduce these variables, and then these variables enter in conflict with quantum prediction, and the questions are different. And Bell explicitly in the Bergman Sox paper said the situation of quantum mechanics is not like the Sox. The whole point of the article was to show it's not like the Sox. Gelman reads it, quotes it, and says it's like the Sox. How could you miss the point? And it's a genius, okay? I'm not denying that it's a genius. Hawking also another genius. Einstein view what we would now call a hidden variable theory. Hidden variables might seem to be the most obvious way to incorporate the uncertainty principle into physics. I'm not sure why. They form the basis of the mental picture of the universe held by many scientists and almost all philosophers of science. That's not really not true, but these hidden variable theories are common. The British physicist John Bell, who died recently, devised an experimental test that would distinguish hidden variable theory. When the experiment was carried out carefully, the result were inconsistent with the hidden variable. The hidden variable being this variable A of 1, B of 1, etc. Of course, there. But why did you introduce these variables? To save locality. So it's locality that's false. And this is the point completely. In my book, I. Uh, let me just move on to that. In my book, I full, like lots of other famous people, even recently, people have made conferences in honor of them, where they completely, the whole conference, in, I think it was in Vienna, misses the point about that. It's quite extraordinary. And, uh, the, um, and of course, what you should also read is the born Einstein correspondence, because Einstein is the one who introduced the EPR paradox, well, with P now, but you know, he introduced, and he was always worried about the fact that quantum mechanics is not local. He was worried about that in 1927, he was worried about that in 1909, even in some sense. 
So he always was like that. And nobody got the point. Born didn't get the point on the answer to Libya. And Born systematically misunderstand. Einstein sent him an article and he says, read this as if you were a visitor from Mars, and that will explain to you what I say. And then Born makes a comment. He says what Einstein could not accept is that events at different places could be correlated. Of course he could accept that. He could accept that there is causal connection. And he saw that implicitly quantum mechanics implies these connections. Yes. Okay, and one remark to this. So, so there are two different meanings to the expression hidden variables. Sometimes mm -hmm. when people say hidden variables, they mean any variable in addition to the wave function. And yeah. sometimes they mean oh, true values for observables, such as these spin values. So for example, Bohmian mechanics adds variables to the wave function, the particle positions. So it's a hidden variables theory in that sense. But actually, Bohmian mechanics does not attribute any values to these spin uh, observables, so it's a no hidden variables in that sense. Exactly. So that plays a role to this uh, to this uh, uh, quote of Hawking, uh, I think, um, because um, well, in, in in the course of uh, Bell's proof, uh, hidden variables in the sense of actual variables of the spin observables were excluded, yeah. but uh, uh, certainly did not exclude Bohmian mechanics or theories of this type. There's an enormous amount of confusion when people think of hidden variable and no hidden variable theorems. And I will explain all the no hidden variable theorems in detail tomorrow. So stay tuned. But uh, the, 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 the no, you see, they speak of hidden variable theories. Uh, Boom is a hidden variable theorist that doesn't have the hidden variable that are precluded by the no hidden variable theorems. In particular, it doesn't have the spin value. So I just explained, there's no spin value. In in that because the way in Bohm because the way you measure the spin in a given direction by putting the orientation of the gradient of the field here or there may change its value. So there is no value of the spin. There is a wave function, but there is no value of the spin pre-existing to the measurement. So in, it, that's the beauty of Bohm. It introduces of course position, but all the other observables are in some sense in existence, or at least the measurements are not measurements of actual values. I'm almost finished. So I just wanted to say, I, I don't really see the difference. But maybe you could clarify this. Because for me, it seems that Bohmian mechanics also just takes the position observable and says that the eigenstates of the position variable are in variables. So uh, I mean, I agree, of course, Bohmian mechanics doesn't say that spin are the spin eigenvalues are the in variables, but it chooses the position observable. And maybe it's justified, OK, but, but still, you just choose sure, sure. this observable. Sure, we introduce we don't speak of observable to start with, but we introduce, of course, position. We think particles of trajectories, and the introduction of trajectories is enough to explain all the spin observation, all the uh, momentum measurement, etc. So yeah. we account for all the other so-called observable, which are not observable because you don't observe anything. You just interact with the system. All the calculus of operators is a handy way to do the statistics of, in the end, position. Yeah. So the, the two definitions I would formulate is, <coughs> one was you add some variables to the wave function, whatever these variables are, that would, would define one class of theories. The other is, for every observable, you introduce an actual value. For every? Yes. Okay. okay, so let me skip the Feynman code. Feynman actually made an argument, which is similar to Bell, and he, he realized that there is a problem. He didn't spell it out. And of course, an injustice in the world is that he didn't mention Bell, and then the article of Feynman is the one which is used at the basis of quantum computing, even though he did the same thing as Bell. But I will not, it will be take too much time, and uh, my time is over. So I want to finish by a summary of Mermaid, which I like. He says, contemporary physicists come in two varieties. Type 1 are not bothered by EPI and Bell. Type 2 uh, are but are bothered. That's me. The majority are not. But you have to distinguish two sub varieties. Type 2 A physicists explain why they are not bothered. Their explanation tends to either miss the point entirely, as I said before, or to contain physical assertions that can be shown to be false. Type 2 B are not bothered and refuse to explain why. Their position is unassailable. There is a variant of 2 B who says that both straighten out the whole business but refuse to explain how. I think that's a good typology. But needless to say, I mean, type 1. 
the time to let them go back to your laboratories and go bother your colleagues and friends and so on and ask them and then you say, ah, oh, you are too tight to be. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so situation being desperate, you know, for science is concerned, I think I'm going to end up with uh, escaping into the literature. I know that most men, including those at ease with problems of the highest complexity, can seldom accept even the simplest and most obvious truth. Everything I say is very simple and obvious. If it be such as would oblige them to admit the falsity of conclusions which they have delighted in explaining to colleagues, which they have proudly told to others, and we have woven thread by thread into the fabric of their life. Well, the rest is the appendix with the computation of one for that. I'll give you some exercise and thank you for that uh, for two space-like separated points there, there must be the possibility of an influence either from A to B or from B to A. Now if, if you have a theory that allows influences towards the past, uh, either time-like past or light-like past, then of course you could easily imagine if A can influence something in the past of A, say some point C, and from that point C you could have an influence towards the future towards B, yes, then uh, yeah, for, for such a theory, it would be easy to create non-local effects. Yeah. Uh, I think that uh, um, uh, there is no theory uh, of the type as Bohm or GW or many worlds that is kind of fully worked out and that uh, reproduces uh, this, uh, the predictions exactly. of quantum exactly. mechanics that is of this retrocausal character, uh, as far as I know. There are some, uh, some toy models uh, one of which I've developed myself, um, but th that these toy models they, they can do certain things, but not kind of uh, uh, fully account of uh, all these experiments. So, for example, this toy model that I wrote down in one paper, it uh, it has um, non-local effects, but does not, in general, reproduce the the statistics predicted by quantum mechanics. Okay. So. Yeah. Um, so I'm just trying to sort out the, the different implications towards the VPR product. So um, the, the, the what the towards the the the, the, um, the EPR the, paradigm. The, in, the um, interdiction of the VPR problem. So the interdiction being um, that you cannot you have to um, get rid either of separability or about, well you cannot combine separability. Um, and um, the completeness of quantum mechanics. So, yeah, that's what. No, you are repeating what you learn elsewhere. This is not what I said. You may not agree with me, but you see, the point is that I was definitely, I was working a lot on this lecture to give a consistent story that does not go to things like separability and so on, which is something I never understood myself. Now, what is okay, separability? You can call it lo lo locality. locality. Yeah, but it's not, yeah, okay, so I, I cannot have locality here. Well, uh, separability is just the fact that uh, you can describe uh, things, um, well, it's that you don't, you, you don't have to use the other objects of the universe to describe
by what you're describing. So if there can be any influence at a distance, <coughs> there's no separability. Okay. Um, so we, we agree, I, I guess, that uh, you can have either the position that uh, you uh, deny separability, either that you deny completeness, either no. that you deny both of them. No, 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 no. The denial of completeness is a consequence of assuming what you call separability. That's what I try to prove over and over again. You see, that's why people always think that in Bells there is some assumption that quantum mechanics is not complete, or that uh, uh, an assumption of realism, it's a very good article by Tumulka explaining these things, I mean, and also by me, I mean, I, I also wrote an article about and that, and, uh, um, you know, uh, modeling has written an article, there is no further assumption. So you say it's not, there is no possibility of um, saying that there is... Uh, Separability? Uh, yeah, like, uh, for example, when, when he said that you could go backwards in time, that's the kind of uh, theories that, uh, that would uh, refute um, the completeness, but not the separability. Because you can still describe, um, like, from, from close to close, all the events. It's just that you, you must go on time. But, but if you could influence, if you had retrocausation, so yeah. if you could influence something in the past, then you could easily influence something at space-like separation, because from the past point, uh, some influences go, could go towards the future. Now, locality means that you cannot influence events happening at space-like separation. Or more precisely, when you consider two events that are space-like separation, they cannot influence each other. So the, the, the slight difference is there is no agent involved. OK, wh whatever. You see, uh, so, me, but I, well, the question was, uh, can we, so you don't think that we can sort out the, the theories, for, because, um, for example, uh, collapse theories, they refute both, because they refute um, the separability because they are non-local, and they also refute that quantum mechanics complete because they are some function of quantum mechanics. Because they can't hear that. I'm sorry. So, <laughs> Collapse theories, they refuse, they refuse the variability because they are non local and they also refuse the completeness of quantum mechanics because uh, they have yeah, some quantum sure, okay. mechanics. Um, Bohm theories, I think, what it's they refuse is local and, and, and com more complete. That I agree. Yeah, but usually theory. people say that you have to choose between locality, uh, non local, uh, you can, uh, you assume, uh, Ben assumes both realism. He assumes hidden variable or something like that. He assumes realism or hidden variable and so on. And, he, and that's inconsistent with experiment. And then we don't have to give up locality. But those precise hidden variables are introduced uh, in order to save locality. I mean, as Merlin says, if you take this apparatus and assuming it really can be done, then you just have a series of uh, switches of this uh, needle there and there. You can with one, two, three, one, two, three there, and then you have a set of green and red lights, and all you ask is explain to me these statistics. Okay? And if they are perfectly correlated, you would say that's because something comes from the source, and then the statistics, when they are not the same, show that there is a contradiction. That's it, that's that. um, I'm interested in how Lonian mechanics, uh, the difference between entangled and non entangled particles, is being construed. Well, if they are not entangled, you had an exercise yesterday showing that if the wave function is a product, then the motion of one particle is independent of the other. So just to be sure, you're saying that um, you, that they over, overcame, oh, well, <laughs> that he refuted the EPR problem, that there is no EPR problem, that because no. uh, you can, <coughs> what? I no, EPR, like, uh, no, again. EPR made a dilemma. You understand what the dilemma is? Yeah, I would say, think, of, think no, of EPR no, as no, an no, argument. No. So people often say EPR paradox, et, uh, et cetera. Yeah, the, the, paradox. E the easiest way to understand what's going on is to think of it as an argument. They gave a proof showing that if the world is local, then there must be hidden variables. No, that wasn't the formulation of Einstein. No, no, that's, what, like that. that's how we formulated in this talk. Let's take to my talk. Because if we have to go to all the papers in history, then it's a longer story. Yeah, no, I wasn't saying that. I just, I was saying that maybe um, there's a 
third option that uh, no one considers, and it's not a dilemma, it's a trilemma. What is it? And so I cannot, I cannot explain in the way that you talk, I can only explain in the other way, I would have to think to explain it in the other way, but um, so it, it is in the way that we are talking, the imperial paradox is not, uh, you don't have to make a choice, it's just that it says that some things are incompatible. You cannot accept both separability and complicity. But this is a trilemma because you can reject both. Oh, oh yes, 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 yes. But the point isn't a trilemma because you have this dilemma. And of course, it's true that in Bohm, you see, in, in, in Bohm, the theory is not local, uh, but these variables don't exist, that you reject both. That's true. But that's not the same thing as saying it's not a dilemma. The dilemma is saying you are forced to reject at least one of them. You could reject both, that's true. But that's not the same thing as saying that there is a third option. You see, the option is that you're, the dilemma is you have to reject one or the other. You have to, uh, uh, locality implies one or the other. Or you can not embrace any of them. <laughs> yeah, the point is the logic, you see. Yes, this, yes that's true, but it's also obvious. So, I mean, yes, we are aware, aware, aware that Bell was aware of that, so it's, it's not kind of something that people yeah. didn't notice before. Let me go to this question because there are many other questions. Can you go to the slide where you said um, that messaging was not well defined, it was just a human concept? Well, because messages has to be, you know... There's some other slide, I guess. Say there is a precise definition of this. It is say if I change my initial conditions or my wave function anyway in some region of space time, then the wave function which comes out in the perturbation of the quantum theory has just is just allowed to change in the future and the backwards light and nowhere else. I would say this is the precise definition of causality. Yeah, and but the you see the theory the, fulfills this. You see if Alice and Bob do I mean uh, the stern dialog experiment to repeat the experiment in times, and then you just see a set of yes and no answer, okay, red and green flashes, mm -hmm. and it's a random sequence. Nothing, you just see this, and it doesn't have any pattern, you don't have any messages. Exactly. The, only, the only surprise is when Alice and Bob get together afterwards. You could change what's going on at Alice's side, for instance, and it would not affect the quantum state of Bob's side. Of course it does. Collapses the state. That's the if, you, if you consider Alice and Bob inside the quantum system, it does not. You just entangle the state of Alice and Bob with the quantum system. So there is not really a collapse, it just looks like a collapse. Okay, I'm following the usual quantum mechanical rules in textbook. In but textbook, it does, yes. In the case it does, but in many worlds, the following mechanics it is not. Yeah, and I think on that slide, Jean was just arguing that uh, that Copenhagen or uh, collapse theories in this uh, Einstein boxes uh, uh, thought experiment uh, will have non-local consequences. Whereas, for example, Bohmian mechanics is still local in this Einstein boxes example, but non-local in another experiment. Mm -hmm. I think that was the point. Any other So when we're talking about causality, to me it seems like you're defining it in terms of like uh, normal causality in terms of light from right? But so the way I understand causality, to me it's like associated with the past hypothesis. I think it was David Alpert who came up with it. Like uh, you need, uh, because to have causality, you need to have asymmetry in, uh, in, in, in your time coordinate. Like time has to run from uh, in one direction. If you don't have that, you don't have the notion of uh, causality, like as classically defined. So, uh, when you were talking causality, I, I, I don't know how you can incorporate that into like any form of uh, formalism of quantum mechanics. There are, if you have evolution equation, then you can say that the initial condition caused the later one. That's yeah, one way. yeah, but the evolution equation can go backwards in time as well. There's nothing in the... I don't know any physical theory which has evolution equation going backwards in time. Yeah, but like all the... Uh, even 
change, a Schrodinger's equation that can go backwards in time, right? Like, no, this. You can reverse the time evolution, that's true. Yeah. Yes. Let me give, give some reaction to that. So in, in these theories that we consider, Bohm, Copenhagen, uh, GRW, many worlds, uh, it's always the, the structure that you can have external fields. So you can leave it open uh, uh, what the experimenters do, how Alice and Bob make their choices. Uh, could be any way, anything. They could make random choices or deterministic choices or pseudo-random number generators or free will, perhaps, uh, whatever. It's left open. Uh, you can apply the, the theory to, uh, to any situation. The theory has an answer for whatever choice Alice and Bob make. So this is kind of, the theory kind of, in a sense, treats it like free will. Now you can say, okay, if I look at the universe as a whole, then uh, there's also a wave function for Alice and a wave function for Bob, or a wave function for everything together. And uh, if that evolves according to the Schrödinger equation, there's some determinism there. Uh, so that changes the story. Uh, uh, yes, but still, uh, the, these theories actually uh, don't, don't make use of any uh, of these quantum states of Alice and Bob. So, the theories treat Alice and Bob as if they had genuine free will. And that's also what you want for an explanation of these correlations. Okay. Okay. You are so, can you talk mention that there is no uh, generalization of the theories in a very specific case? Uh, no, you could, you, well, first of all, you could, it depends what you mean by relativistic. You see, you should read the Bell, Bell article saying how to teach special relativity, and you would realize that having a privileged claim is not against relativity, not against any facts that are supposed to, uh, to uh, support the theory of relativity. In fact, you know, Poincaré and Lorenz talk of relativity as the different way than Einstein did. And we, I'm not really, uh, can I say, maybe what they can describe it better than I do, but I, I am uh, going to be tired and uh, I've forgotten a little bit this article, but you could, of course, make a relativistic theory with the preferred frame. Uh, like in, in, in some slides, you mentioned that uh, the relativistic theory No, what I say is that in honor, you see the problem is that people say oh, that ordinary quantum mechanics is relat there is relativistic quantum mechanics and quantum field theory and so on, which are Lorentz invariant, but this is extremely formal. There is a Lagrangian which is Lorentz invariant, but there is never any discussion of the collapse between space like separated particles in a relativistic fashion. So there is no, you see, my view is that there is no such thing as a relativistic quantum theory, even ordinary quantum theory, because they never discuss the collapse in a relativistic way, and of course they cannot because it's instantaneous. And then you have the whole point of instantaneity. The only way out is indeed to say, oh, the wave functions about information, then when you make it precise, you get to this hidden variable, and then you get the... Uh, yes. well, right. the, huh? the second one says there's no collapse. So, that's a solid problem. Yeah, I know. But then we get into other, another <laughs> discussion. Yes, in this other lecture by Matthias, uh, he will kind of focus on possibilities of what can you do with Bohmian mechanics or collapse theories, uh, etc., in relativistic space time. So the topic will come up again there. So maybe that will be helpful then. I want to emphasize, I want to at least you know, shock you a little bit and uh, show you. But you see, it's, let me say what I think about relativity. Even get it in the Okay? It always applies when you teach it to the student, you say you apply it to a closed system. But then what is a closed system? For example, on Earth, we have the influence of the moon and the influence of the sun, etc. And uh, we say, well, we can detect it if we study this thing, but if you study the tides, then you have to take into account the moon, etc. So you always idealize things as being isolated for all practical purposes. Okay? Now, of course, if you want to be really rigorous, you can say, oh, but there's nothing really isolated. So the only isolated system in the universe as a whole. Then I, now, let's think Galilean invariance. Now I apply Galilean invariance to the universe as a whole. Well, there are no consequences. There's conservation.
information that are meant to from the whole universe, right? Like, uh, I'm interested, of course, in the consequent the conservation laws for supposedly uh, almost isolated system here on Earth. The problem that quantum mechanics raises with this non locality is that now it's not just that there are no isolated system, uh, like the sun may influence events on the Earth, but then you can neglect it or something like that. Is that because of non locality and the fact that the effects does not decrease with distance, if you have entangled state, then doing a measurement on Sirius may affect the situation there on Earth by a fixed amount, you know, which is not something that decreases with the distance. The only way out of that is again a practical thing that it's very difficult to maintain this purely entangled state without getting them entangled with other things and then it becomes a mess and the action at the distance doesn't work. So again in practice we can consider semi-isolated system, but the problem in principle of isolation is much harder in quantum mechanics than in non uh, you see. But of course it all depends what you mean by relativity, because relativity you always apply Galilean or Einsteinian. You apply it to supposedly isolated system on Earth, otherwise there are no practical consequences of relativity like the conservation laws, etc. So it's always the issue in the end is are there isolated system? And then quantum mechanics says, well, in theory, there are less uh, systems are never isolated as much, or at least approximately as much as they could be classically. That's the answer. And then of course you can if you wish. Then of course you have to you see the, the notion of relativity, and that was very strong in Einstein, is entangled, if I may use this expression, with the notion of locality. In Einstein mind, relativity of course was related to locality. If you believe in locality, then of course if you mix locality and relativity, then of course uh, that's a mix, but you don't have to mix. If you really want only relativity or Lorentz invariant, then you have to explain to what system you apply, what isolated system means, etc. etc. And and then of course that's a separate discussion. So you have to see whether when you think of relativity, you think of locality implicitly or not. That's it. Maybe one last question. Well, yeah, simple question. But okay, you, you ask a question. Let, let's take these three okay. questions. Okay, you, you. Okay, so um, putting aside what were the question what were Bell, were Bell's predictions were, would you agree that you can say that if just looking at Bell's theorem, that the theorem in its form and form, that the, the amazing thing about this theorem that Bell actually showed that there can be an experiment which has already been done now, nowadays, which can show you or prove that a certain set of assumptions are compatible, assumptions and these assumptions are locally, locality, realism, no. causality. Let, let, let me finish. Causality, maybe, maybe even some, some more fundamental and really easy to understand assumptions. But the experiment shows that you cannot hold a consistent worldview that, that combines all these things. That it's realist, that, that it's local, and not, it's, it, I mean, it's not an experiment about quantum mechanics, right? It's an experiment about physics. So it shows that, 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 that nature is as such, right? That, that there can be no theory, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. which is realistic local and, and, and has the causality and, and everything in it. Why, or, or, or if you don't accept that, then, then why, why do you say that necessarily it is, it is only about you have to give up the locality? Why, why is it not an option to give the other thing? You see, what I, what, I, what I find annoying in these talks is that some of you come with preconceived notions that you get from other talks and books and so on which repeat things, which I try very patiently to explain is wrong. Now, I may be wrong, you may object to what I say, but I say repeatedly in the talk that there is no assumption of realism, and what is called the assumption of realism is the introduction of those variables A of alpha equal plus or minus one, B of alpha equal plus or minus one. So if you listen to my talk, you don't have to, you don't have to agree with me, but the argument was that in order to explain the perfect correlation, we introduce those variables, and that's it. And there is no assumption of those variables. And Bell says that very explicitly. He says, you know, the, the, uh, he says that the, the assumption that he makes of these variables is not an assumption, but it's inferred from assumption of locality. And then if you prove those variables are inconsistent with the experiment, then it means locality is false. That's the dilemma. I've been repeating, repeating, repeating. I may be wrong, but you have to explain to me how you account for this perfect correlation without assuming these predetermined values in this direction at the distance. That's the, the, the problem. And of course, as I said, the problem is that people come here, if they have heard about them, they have this 
preconceived notion that they introduced the notion of realism. And now, of course, I force you to read to look at article which discusses on this notion of realism, because realism is the most ill-defined notion in philosophy of science. So anyway, let, let's go quickly. So one more question there. And I have a technical question. I'm so actually asking you why when two students experiment this and not mine. There's a whole symmetry in common that comes to I understand that. It's an indigenous idea. So it's not obvious to me. No, OK. It's not obvious. Will you? It's not obvious, but it's true. I'm not going to explain it in detail, but it's true that the well-known and I'm not going to it. Anyway, I, I, I'm not going to move the slide, but they, it's still true that the particle, if it goes, starts above the middle line, it will go up. That was also explained in the electromagnetic system. There. So one last question there. Um, I just wanted to add that uh, the relational quantum mechanics uh, overrides the inter uh, problem uh, using relativity. So it's not um, it, it not incompatible, and so it's uh, non non local. It's local. So you claim that there is a local theory. Yeah. Which. Uh, that, uh, that so what's wrong in my head? Tell me what's wrong in my head. You can't tell me there's a theory which is um, wrong. What is wrong is that you don't take uh, that you suppose um, that simultaneity is possible. In the uh, relative equation and uh, quantum mechanics, you don't you never assume uh, simultaneity. So you don't have intricate states because they, they cannot be compared because they are not in the same place. No, but John didn't make any such assumption. He assumed that after doing the experiment, Alice and Bob bring together their results. Now they look at their results. Was it one, uh, one yes, two, no, etc.? So that was one of the John's slides. You just look at these results, and then you draw your conclusions. No, because he, had, he also asked the question of what was happening at, before we, we look at the results, what was happening with the two particles no. simultaneously? No. No, no. But yeah, that's the, the bottom of the problem. No. Otherwise, if you don't ask about that question, there's no problem. No, but, uh, look, I have this data. Okay, these are data. I have a million of them. Okay, I have 54 because I have one slide. But I have a million data with those statistics. Now, explain to me those statistics. I'm only talking about that. I don't know anything about quantum mechanics. I don't know what the quantum state is. I don't know anything. I don't, no, no, I give to a child or to a statistician, let's say, maybe that's what we better. This supposes uh, simultaneity because... No! Yeah. No, 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 no. Because because no, what, no, no, no. What is doing someone while the other is doing... But the, but the, the, the measurements... Like while the answer the is measurements like. now, the measurements, the actual measurements are done in a way which is simultaneous in the sense that the, 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 it, it goes, it would, in order to communicate between the two parts of the experiments, would go at a speed which is 50,000 times the speed of light. That's the present precision of the experiment. The experiments are made simultaneously by the people who make them. When they do these measurements, they do it at that simultaneity, the Chinese or the people in Munich or in Delft. You are talking about instantaneous uh, influence at a distance. This is simultaneity. No, he's, he said that about collapse theory. He said that if you apply the usual collapse theory, you do it in one reference frame, you have, you're using some, some assumption of simultaneity. But for the, for the EPR argument, no such assumption was considered. And for the Bell argument, no such assumption there. Um, actually, yes, because um, if you ask what non-locality means, it means that something can have, have influence at a distance on something. And space-like separation. Yeah, you don't need to talk about simultaneity. Yes, because um, you cannot talk about different points in space um, at the same well, you cannot talk about them because they're separate in time. You, you can say what it means for two space time points to be space like separated without having chosen any reference frame and therefore defined any surfaces of simultaneity. And it's only the space like separation that matters here. Yeah, so. Yeah, maybe we should continue in the break. So then, let's thank John again.